Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, Baker Institute for our special event with our distinguished speaker, uh, the Ambassador of uh, France, uh, Pierre Vimont. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, greet you all uh, this evening. Uh, this is an event that has been uh, coordinated with the Consulate General of France here in uh, Houston and uh, the Consul General, Monsieur Grandjoin and uh, with the uh, French-American Foundation, uh, Nicholas Duggan, the president of the French-American Foundation, and Paul Clemenceau, who is the local representative, who all collaborated uh, for <clears throat> bringing the uh, ambassador here uh, to speak with us. Uh, this is a uh, bit of a tradition uh, that we've had at the Baker Institute. Uh, we've had some very uh, eminent uh, French speakers, uh, including uh, former President Giscard d'Estaing, uh, Dominique de Villepin, uh, former foreign minister, prime minister of France here. Uh, we've had Ambassador Levite, uh, Jean-David Levite, the predecessor of Ambassador Vimont. Uh, so we, we pay attention and are very uh, interested in French-United States relations and U.S. relations with Europe. So uh, we're delighted uh, that uh, the ambassador has uh, come to the Baker Institute uh, this evening. Uh, he has gr gracefully accepted to take questions after his presentation. He will uh, take questions directly uh, from you, uh, from the audience. It's now my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Dungan, who was elected president of the French American Foundation in August 2005, and he himself is an expert in transatlantic relations and non-state actors. He will introduce uh, Ambassador Vimo. Uh, Nicholas. Thank you. It's a, it's a great honor for me to be here to introduce Ambassador Vimont. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the Baker Institute, Ambassador Deregin, the French Consul General here in Houston. Um, this is an instance where a non-governmental organization such as ours, which actually was founded by and, and, and whose foundation was announced by President Giscard d'Estaing in 1976, um, it's an excellent example of where a non-governmental organization and French diplomacy can cooperate. I think um, we are very lucky to have Ambassador Vimont uh, speaking to us tonight. Um, first of all, because he is the ambassador of France, France and the United States alliance does not need any introduction from me. Secondly, because he is Pierre Vimont and because he has had such a distinguished career as a French diplomat, um, serving as the director de cabinet, the chief of staff to the last three foreign ministers and having been before that the ambassador to the European Union. And if you say, well, what more could you ask for? The only thing more that you could ask for is this, uh, and that is that France today has a leadership in its diplomacy and indeed in, from the president onwards, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy as president, Bernard Kouchner as foreign minister, Jean-David Lévy, the former ambassador here, as the chief diplomatic advisor, and Ambassador Vimont, having come from his positions of influence, power, knowledge, and understanding of French diplomacy, in which, of which he was a principal architect, we couldn't ask for much more as the United States. And you may recall that when President Kennedy received the Nobel Prize winners in the East Room, he said that this is the greatest gathering of genius in this room, except for when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. And this is the greatest gathering of French uh, power and concentration on the United States-French relationship, at least since the time when Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and the Comte de Vergennes were working together on establishing that relationship. I think there's a great deal that France is thinking about. There's a great deal that the European Union is thinking about that can be of great interest and benefit to us in the United States. So I myself am looking forward to listening to Ambassador Vimont address us on the topic of France and America, a new era for old friends. Pierre Vimont. I want to thank uh, Nicolas and President and Ambassador 
Jiregion, but listening to what Nicolas was saying about those uh, four prestigious names that he just mentioned, we have a game uh, in, in France called something like Chercher l'erreur, try to find a mistake. Uh, and with those four names, I think there is a mistake to add the fourth one, and, which was mine, you're too kind. But I'm not sure that President Sarkozy would be uh, appealed by such, by such a company. So uh, um, let me really uh, now go to the subject and as quickly as possible because I think uh, what could be interesting really is uh, for all of you to ask as many questions as you would like to, to, to ask. And, and therefore the title that was chosen I think among uh, other people by Nicolas, it was a, a common agreement on that, uh, a new era for old friends, uh, seems to me a, a very interesting topic on which maybe we could uh, go back a few minutes to, to really understand what's going on at the moment uh, with regard to the relationship between uh, your country and, and, and mine. Uh, old friends, we, we are truly old friends. Uh, if we go back to uh, the time of Lafayette and uh, George Washington and this uh, incredible friendship that uh, uh, came out of that, of that period between our, our two countries, right up to uh, the last century when by tw twice uh, uh, your country came to the uh, rescue of France and helped us uh, to free from, uh, uh, from the Germans, uh, which were at the time fighting us in World War I and World War II. Uh, there is undoubtedly a very strong relationship between our two countries and very strong friendship. I think uh, many times it has been reminded that I think uh, that of all the countries uh, with which France have had relation and quite often a difficult relation thanks to people like Napoleon in the 19th century, um, uh, the United States is the only country with which we haven't had any war and, and that, that tells a lot if you look at the, uh, France history. But it's true also and I think we have to remind that uh, also from time to time that just like all friends, we had quite often bickering and, and, and dispute. Uh, uh, everybody has in mind, of course, Iraq, but just go a little bit uh, further back uh, in, in our history. Uh, the goal and uh, the decision to get out of NATO, uh, even at uh, 85, 86, it was in fact 86, when uh, for reasons that we have not yet totally understood, France decided not to uh, set up uh, on the same side as, as your country with regard to Libya at the time when we were at, uh, your country was having this uh, uh, tension with, uh, with Libya. So so time and again we've had this uh, tradition of uh not always agreeing together and uh, having uh, this dispute become rather public and making arguments, some sort of argument of those, of those issues. And I think this is what is new today and this is something why are we in a new area, era. I think this is what I preci preci precisely wanted to explain to you. I think the main difference uh, with what has happened in the past is that now, first of all, we've got a new president, a very energetic and dynamic president who speaks uh, very forcibly, tells what he thinks and uh, uh, goes on publicly uh, stating his position. And this is a, a new president who has said uh, very clearly when he, not, he was not even uh, elected that he wanted to change the atmosphere and the feeling of the relationship between the two countries. He stated very clearly that he was a, a friend of America, that he wanted to remain a friend of America, and that he thought that something should change in the relationship between our two countries. In other words, let's stop those bickerings. If we have difference, let's try to uh, uh, arrange uh, and find a solution every time that is possible. But let's not make political argument of, uh, of every time we may have differences of view. On the contrary, let's try to build uh, a relation of trust and, and confidence. And I think that sounded very strange, to be honest, in, in France, because uh, uh, there was this uh, uh, idea among the French political analysts that uh, um, the uh, bickering between the two countries was part of political life in France, that it was necessary if you wanted to be elected to show that uh, you could stand up to the, to, to the United States. 
And a lot of uh, French uh, political observers said to uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, you're making a terrible mistake by stating this position even before the election. Uh, you're going to lose your, the election because nobody has ever uh, stand up for a presidency by uh, stating publicly that he's a friend of America. And what happened, as you know, is that uh, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy was elected, well elected, by a turno turnout of more than 75% and with a, a, a good majority in France, which was something like 50, 53%. So Sarkozy, by that way, has um, shown, I think, very clearly and confirmed very clearly, clearly something that is not always well understood, is that I think deeply in their heart, the, uh, my, my French countrymen, uh, my fellow countrymen, are very fond of your country, and there is a, a true uh, a steam of uh, uh, Americanophilia in, in, in my country. In fact, uh, if you go around and if you visit France, you will be amazed by the number of uh, American movies uh, that are being shown in Paris. Uh, uh, the fact that all the youngsters in France like to dress like uh, uh, American basketball players, uh, uh, that they uh, eat hamburgers, that even go and now uh, drink coffee in Starbucks shops all, all over Paris and, and all over the country. So I think to say that there is a sort of anti-American wave in France is going uh, a lot, much too far. There has been a tradition among some radical left-wing parties and some radical right-wing parties, amazingly, right and radicals right and radical left seem to agree on that, uh, against France, but that in fact has been rather a minority. And French public opinion has much more often be uh, quite admiring uh, and admirative of your country uh, than one could think sometimes by, by uh, reading uh, uh, the American press. Uh, just to give you another example, uh, as uh, Nicolas Sarkozy came here on a bilateral official visit, make, made an, uh, an important address to the Congress, once again, a lot of people said uh, this will not go down well in France. People are going to see that he's uh, starting to align himself on, on, on America. And opinion polls have shown that on the contrary. Uh, the French, in to a large majority, just thought that it was quite all right and they just agree with that. Where the difference lies, and I think this is important, is that at the same time as my fellow countrymen uh, admire very much your country, enjoy the American way of life, uh, enjoy American culture, at the same time they want to retain this um, very strong French exception and specificity uh, that is that we want to decide on our own and that we want to keep this ability to have a, our autonomous point of view and our independent point of view of all foreign uh, affairs, all world affairs as they go on. Maybe because we just believe, as you are, that we are some sort of country that must have a, a sort of universal vocation to talk about everything, to think about everything, to have views on every issue that appears in the world. And mind you, that puts us in a very special seat. I worked many years in Europe and I can tell you that not even the British behave in the same way today. And when we meet with all our European counterparts and uh, the French diplomats start to say we should say something about what's happening in Burma, we should talk about what's happening in Tibet, European should, Europeans should come out and uh, take an initiative in the Middle East, on Iraq, in Afghanistan, whatever it is, most of our partners usually tell us What's the point? Uh, why do you think we should really speak on that? Uh, uh, it's not in the interest of Europe. Uh, we have nothing to say on that. And France alone, very much like the, Amer the Americans, goes on saying, but it's necessary. We have a, a universal vocation. We have to speak all around the world. And we need to say where we are and where we stand for and what we stand for. And I think this explains a lot maybe of uh, what is France today and what it is trying to do. Uh, second observation I want to make is that Nicolas Sarkozy not only uh, said that he was a great friend of your country and that uh, he wanted today to have a closer and friendlier relationship with, with your country, he took some initiative uh, with, with regard to that. And I think 
on twofold. Uh, the first one was on a few issues about foreign policy. Uh, I could give you a lot of examples. I'll just give you three so that you understand. Iraq, Afghanistan, and NATO. And those initiatives, he took them very quickly as soon as he came back, to, as, as he arrived in power. The first one and the most impressive one was, of course, Iraq. His predecessor, Jacques Chirac, had decided uh, after uh, uh, the uh, military intervention in 2003 that France would not criticize anymore uh, America publicly, uh, but uh, that France would, would just stay outside of, the, of that issue, uh, that we had nothing to win, what I was telling you a few minutes ago about universal uh, vocation, you find immediately uh, an exception there. France didn't want to talk any more about that, wanted to retain as far as possible as, uh, from Iraq, and therefore we would just be silent and not try anything. When Nicolas Sarkozy, with the help of Bernard Kouchner, our new foreign minister, came in, they both decided that they should do something and try to see if they could help and bring some contribution to the uh, present situation. And therefore, Bernard Kouchner went there. I must say that he came back with uh, uh, the, uh, the feeling and the strong impression that uh, there was a lot to do, in fact. And uh, we decided that uh, through our development aid, through our political a possibility and more political contacts with many of our friends, we should try to see how we could help and how we could contribute to start what is quite obvious to all of us with Iraq is the need to find a political solution and indeed by a way or another to reconcile the different communities, to go for political dialogue and for national reconciliation among all of those uh, members of the Iraqi population. Let's have no doubt about it. This is very complicated and this is going to take a lot of time. But at least France is there, back uh, in the, uh, at the forefront of the international community, talking with the uh, different countries of the area, talking with uh, our European partners, talking with the international community to see if we can do something. And very recently, as you may remember, Nicolas Sarkozy has even said that he was prepared to host uh, an international conference in Paris, if that were agreed to all the uh, Iraqi political parties, to see if we could try to work and get something out of this. A second example, Afghanistan. There also, um, Nicolas Sarkozy came out very clearly and very loudly by stating three or four important points. The first one is that we were there to stay in Afghanistan as long as necessary. And I think maybe this was the most important statement, because as you may know, in many of our European countries at the moment, Germany, Netherlands, maybe even Britain, uh, a lot of uh, the citizens of those countries are just starting to wonder what are we doing in, in Afghanistan and should we get out of that place uh, because um, uh, things are getting more difficult and we have the impression sometimes that we are facing uh, an Afghan population that doesn't understand anymore what we're doing there and that is uh, looking at us just like one uh, major uh, occupying force. So Nicolas Sarkozy said we have to stick to our position and we have to stay there. We have to be loyal to the NATO alliance and to this NATO operation we launched uh, many years ago. But, and this is where you will find France again, because we're France and we don't change as easily as that, uh, we think at the same time that as long as we stay there and as we are even prepared to increase our military contribution, we have to say very clearly that uh, there will be no military solution there and that what we have to think about now more and more altogether is trying to find again a coherent and global strategy that we had maybe at the beginning when we intervened uh, in Iraq but that we have more or less lost since then. When, what, I, what I mean by global strategy is that it's not only being there on a military basis, it's also looking at the political situation, trying to see how we can manage to find ways for President Karzai to talk more with the uh, regional leaders, the tribal leaders that are there, try to see how we can help all those people to talk together and to try to find new ways of accommodating the institutions that exist there at the moment. It's also all about how 
we can improve the development assistance and the technical assistance, the financial assistance we're giving to that country. How do we can uh, improve the situation there as time goes on? It has also a lot to do, you know, with the poppy crop uh, and the whole question of the drug there. And also this is an issue we will really have to look at uh, much more firmly and much more seriously than we have done so far. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we can pour as many mili military soldiers we need to, as many, many military people there. This will not solve uh, a situation where more and more the Afghans are just thinking that we are there and we don't understand them and we, don't, we are not any more allies and real, uh, really not supporting them anymore. Third example, as I said a few minutes ago, NATO. Nicolas Sarkozy has stated there also that he thought that the present situation where, in fact, France has more or less come back into NATO, because this is the real truth about uh, our relation with NATO. Uh, precisely all his predecessor didn't dare say so, but uh, since uh, the departure of uh, General de Gaulle from power in France, all his successors have slowly moved back France into NATO. Uh, today, uh, our ministers of foreign affairs and defense attend all the meetings of NATO. We are part of all the working group with the two small exceptions that are not very relevant, by, by the way. The only thing that is lacking at the moment is for us to get back into the military integrated organization. And Nicolas Sarkozy has said, why not? Uh, why should we stay outside? Um, we should maybe look at this and try to change this uh, disposition uh, on one condition. Once again, this is France, so nothing can be as simple as you could imagine. Uh, with uh, one condition, it is that at the same time, we have to improve and enhance our, our European defence. Because what we think before everything is that we must be true partners, and therefore we have to work together with the Americans on one side, with the Europeans on the other side, and to try to be true, solid partners on some sort of equal basis. Now, this is a terrible challenge for, for, for the Europeans, let's be frank about this. When I'm talking of about European defence today, that means that uh, 75 to 80 percent of the total financial effort in the defence sector is made by three countries, uh, Germany, Britain and France, and a little bit behind are Italy, Spain, uh, but not more, more than that. And therefore, if we really want in the future to have a true European defence that can bring about a true European contribution to the world affairs and to the world crisis, we really need to enhance and improve our capabilities. We have already tried to do this, and maybe this has not been said enough, and I should insist on that. The Europeans on their own have managed in the recent years to set up some very important and interesting uh, external military operation in Africa mostly, in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Today we are at the border between Chad and uh, Sudan trying to survey and protect the uh, refugee camps there. So we have some experience now and we think that with that experience we could now play a bigger role in NATO and I think this will be very much looked at in the, in the near future. I'll stop there. I could go on giving you more examples. Iran, Kosovo, uh, the Middle East conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. But I'll stop there and keep that maybe if you wish so for, for the question. The second way uh, Nicolas Sarkozy has tried to show that he was uh, really wanting to change France's attitude and bring France back, I would say, in, in, the, uh, in the mainstream of, uh, of world affairs and in the mainstream also of global economy is the uh, reform process he's going through uh, with uh, the French economy and, and French social sector. And this is very important too. If, wants, if France wants to regain some sort of credibility and some sort of uh, authority in the world and, and be able to speak with a voice that is loud and clear and understood, we can't go on with a country that has some uh, 
very big corporation playing their, their part in the world, undoubtedly. 14 or 15 of our corporations are among the 100 or 200 uh, top league of, uh, of, uh, of uh, corporation in the world. But where, at the same time, everybody has the impression that this country, who it has an incredible potential, economic potential, very high uh, rate of productivity, at the same time seems to be stuck in some of those French fantasies that we have been living through for many years. Um, and uh, this is obvious when you look at um, the uh, survey and the reports made by the OECD. Mm. Um, we have two main problems today in France. One is our, our rate of unemployment. Uh, we're still uh, far away from some of our major partners. Uh, we were up to 10% of uh, unemployment. We've gone slowly down to 8%. Now we're about 7 and 5% and that, that is good. But still, we still have a, a, a problem looking at our working population, where most of our European partners have a, a working population of, uh, uh, I mean, a population uh, uh, um, people working uh, with compared with what could be the potential working population. We are around 68 percent. 68 percent of our of Europeans uh, have uh, are working compared to the potential working population. We are around 62%. We have this gap of 6% that we have to gain back, and it is very important because this lack of uh, potential strikes mostly the young people at the beginning of their career and the people around 55 and more people at the end of their career. And those two categories, we have really to look at them and to try to help them get some job. And the second point is looking at the working hours, because we have decided, you remember a few years ago, that we will go for the 35 hours week. Uh, today, if you look at the statistics, uh, we are working more or less, uh, a little on less uh, 1,600 hours per year, compared to our European partners, we are around 1,800. 1, there also, we have this gap that we have to, uh, to get back on. Uh, and this is precisely what we have decided to do as we go ahead. I wouldn't go into explaining you all the uh, uh, work that is uh, going over, all the different reforms we have started. Just give me uh, five, mention five main, main issues on which we are working. First one is um, precisely uh, enhancing the possibility inciting people to go back and work more on additional hours. We could have done that through new legislation. Uh, that should have been normally the usual way French like to do it. So get a new law saying that uh, 35 hours a week was not the limit anymore, that we should go back to, let's say, 38 or 40 hours or something like that. I think that was... Um, uh, the obvious course that a lot of people thought, a lot of people in France thought should be looked at. I think it was also the natural course for uh, every trade union getting back into the street and starting some sort of new revolution. So Sarkozy, who is rather a clever man and a very good political uh, tactical man, said, no, let's just let the, 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 um, the government, the public uh, administration, will allow employers and employees to work together and to try to decide on their own if they want to get above the 35 hours uh, limit. If they do so, no problem. The, the state will allow them to do that and even those additional uh, hours will not be taxed anymore. So huge incentive. Negotiation are going on at the moment all over France for those additional hours and something new is happening there. Second uh, reform, let's lower our direct taxation, the taxation on our, out, on our income revenue. And also there, it has been decided that the ceiling for that would be 50%. You may be surprised because I think you are much lower than that. But don't forget that we were above 60%. And some uh, of our people in France were paying more than 65 or 60% of, uh, of their incomes from some of the superior trenches of, uh, of, of taxation. So this has also been looked at as some interesting reform. Thirdly, let's try to see how we could bring and, and enhance and encourage uh, research and innovation to start back again in France through, through different means. I wouldn't go into that. But through one mean, that is an interesting one, because on this we're trying to do what you have been doing for many years, encourage our universities to become more autonomous, to go for private money, 
maybe even try to set up an endowment like, like you have in your, in your country. Mind you, we're still very far away from your present situation. But at least we're going into that direction, and that could be interesting. Fourthly, trying also to uh, help uh, small and medium enterprises to, be, uh, uh, to find it easier to get into the business, and we're going to have a small and medium uh, enterprise act, small business act we're trying to set up in our country. And fifthly, and I'm saying that with due respect because I'm a civil servant, uh, trying to change public administration in France, cut into the public expenditure and reform deeply our public administration, which is certainly one of the main problems we have in, in our country. Mind you, that could uh, mean uh, ex uh, closing maybe some embassies and maybe even some uh, general consulates. I apologize to Pierre. But um, we have to look at all this. And at the moment, you may not know that because this is a silent revolution going on. But all, in all the public administration in France, we're going through a sort of review, auditing going on with Nicolas Sarkozy and his closer advisors look at this very deeply, having meetings more or less every week in Paris, and therefore um, throwing uh, in, in the whole French administration a feeling of fear, despair, <laughs> agony. But I think this is very useful and very necessary, so I think in the end something great will come out of this. This is what's going on, therefore, in France. It's going on to such an extent that even sometimes the mind boggles a little bit and maybe uh, and popularity is there. Our, our president at the moment has seen his popularity rate uh, falling rather quickly. But uh, he knew that, and I think everybody knew that this was going to happen, that you have to go through this uh, difficult period. The idea uh, thrown out by Nicolas Sarkozy being that if you do don't that at the beginning of your mandate, then you will never do it. Uh, and so better be uh, brave, better be uh, courageous, and better throw yourself in cold water and swim and see if uh, in one or two years' time uh, things will have improved and we will hope that. Looking now just a few seconds at the future, uh, and I will try to go as quickly as that so that uh, after that we can uh, ask questions. Uh, what are we trying to do and what is trying to happen in, in foreign policy? I think what is interesting, and if I can just throw those ideas, uh, you will understand what I, what I mean. I think it's interesting because we're trying to work on, 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 a two, on two bases. One, I would say it's about method, uh, and it's about trying to find the proper way to look at the main major issues we're facing today. Uh, France there is trying once again to push some of the ideas we've always had for many years in foreign policy, and which allows me to say that to some extent, even in Nicolas Sarkozy has uh, found new ways, have brought new ideas, he's still very much in the tradition of what I would say the mainstream of foreign policy. The first idea is that we want uh, and we rely very much when we try to solve some of the crises we're facing today, we want to rely very much on multilateral approach. Uh, I know this is not always very popular in your country where there is this idea that the UN is a, a huge bureaucracy that is not uh, doing anything very good, uh, that there's no way that we can work with some of the regional institutions, the African Unity, uh, uh, the uh, Association of Latin American Countries, etc. We think that we have to work with those people and then more and more as we go ahead in this uh, multilateral and multipolar world, we need to bring into the uh, on board in our discussions uh, many of those uh, new countries emerging because really this is what it's all about today. If you want to solve, and I hope we will manage one day, the nuclear issue we are facing in Iran, you have quite often to talk to Brazil, to South Africa, so that they bring their voice into the, uh, in, into the, uh, the international arena. They manage to talk with uh, Iran and they try to push their own voice towards uh, Tehran. It's not easy, it hasn't worked so far, 
but it's better to have those people on board because at one point they could be very helpful and by just put, leaving them aside on the, on, the board, on, on the side, we can have after that some real difficulties because uh, those countries, if they have the impression we are just forgetting them, can play their own role and can then become really a nuisance. So we have to be very careful about that. This is why we are supporting the reform of the uh, uh, Security Council in the United Nations. We think that a, a Security Council that today doesn't have as its permanent members country like, I just name a few, you will understand, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Brazil, South Africa, etc., India. Uh, this is uh, a Security Council that may lose credibility and even authority, and why not say it, legitimacy, as we go along. Uh, we think the same thing is true about the G8 meeting. Whatever we may think about the G8 meeting, those meetings taking place every year and talking about the world's economy and who don't have on, on, on board uh, China, uh, India, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, I name it again, etc., are meetings that are going to become more and more irrelevant. And so we think it's very necessary to have on board many of those countries. The second idea with regard to method, I think, is precisely what I was saying about, about Afghanistan. If you look at the major conflicts that we are facing today, you need to have a global approach to, to, towards those, those um, crises if you have any hope of finding a solution one day or another. Are those conflicts, you name it, you will immediately understand. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict today, uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Kosovo, uh, it's not only about uh, a military operation. It's not even only about political uh, solution or political dialogue. It is now more and more about a huge range of complex issues that have to deal with economic and social development, that quite often have to deal with national identity, that have a lot to deal with religious uh, intolerance sometimes, that have to deal with uh, uh, culture uh, and civilization. And and we have to be aware of that. And we have to some extent ra try to be rather modest with regard to the way we have approached so far uh, those issues and try to see if more and more we shouldn't be uh, much more, uh, m much more uh, uh, modest, as I was saying, uh, and much more cautious about the way we approach those, those uh, issues. I can go back on that if you want and be more precise later on, but I just wanted to throw this idea. And the third question about method, and I will end there, is of course the whole question of uh, tolerance and, and dialogue. And this is a major point that Nicolas Sarkozy has tried to push forward uh, in, the recent, in the recent month. Uh, we're all talking about uh, this new threat, this new challenge of the clash of civilization. Some of us are talking about the clash of culture or the clash of religions. Um, and uh, faced with that challenge, quite often the idea is that let's try to push forward our idea about democracy. What is lacking in those countries is a democratic institution, and let's just try and go there and push and force our democratic institution on those countries. We in France have the impression that we have to do otherwise. We are all on the same line. We would like to promote uh, democracy, and we think this is uh, democracy, as it was quite often said, is the best, uh, uh, it's the worst system with the exception of all the others, or something of that sort. Uh, but that we uh, should try to see how far we can go in, in promoting that. But we think that we have to promote that in the right way by showing tolerance towards what uh, is uh, the situation in those countries, trying to understand and have the better analysis possible, the best analysis possible of what is happening in those countries. And quite often what we're seeing in the Muslim world, for instance, is that you have a huge debate between moderates and radicals. And by just coming in uh, and not looking and not seeing and not being able to observe and detect that division between moderates and radicals, what sometimes 
we will bring about is precisely some sort of false unity in, between moderates and radicals, with the radicals gaining ground all the time and forcing the moderates to support them because they are in some sort of a clash with the Western world, with the Western alliance. And I think we have to be uh, very careful with regard to that, and that on the contrary, we have to try to see how we can try to push forward tolerance. But mind you, and this is a very important point that Nicolas Sarkozy is stating also, is that we need to have reciprocity with regard to that. As you know, and I will give you an example, in the religious sector, we are having at the moment, we have at the moment in our, in our country, a Muslim community that is around 7 or 8 percent of the total French population. Huge Muslim community uh, that is asking to have its places uh, for, to practice its religion. And France had said, uh, okay, and the, uh, in our country, whether it be the central government or the local administration, we are opening new mosques here and there, sometimes with public money, sometimes with private funds. And we think it's the right way to proceed uh, because everybody in our country has the right, uh, uh, the freedom of religion brings him the right to exert and exercise its own religion. But what we think, as we go on uh, that way, is that the same thing should be true in the uh, Muslim countries. And mind you, this was true about 20 years ago. Uh, in countries like Tunisia, or like Egypt, even Iraq we're talking about, uh, there were uh, Christian churches, there were, for the Jewish community, the possibility to exercise its religion. And slowly this has moved back, and this has gone back. And we think this is not acceptable, and this is why we're going, and Nicolas Sarkozy is in his many trips going around the world, stating in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Saudi South Africa, in Morocco, in Algeria, that they, those countries have to find again the road to tolerance and to religious tolerance. Otherwise, we will not be able to go on forever uh, in Western countries admitting the freedom of religion and this not being the case in those countries. So those are three ideas that we are trying to push forward, the multilateral system, and to promote the multilateral system, to look at uh, the different crises in a global uh, dimension, and also to try to bring about more tolerance. I could go on and on. I'll just stop there. I think that's quite enough. And I will allow for all the questions you wish to ask me. And thank you for listening to me. Raise your hand to the <coughs> One way back here. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Mohamed Um My background is from Middle East until I was 12 or 13. When I was in college, I had a sign on my desk that said, um, let's compromise, we'll do it my way. <laughs> and I'm afraid that has been the policy of our president, dear president of the United States. Uh, when you refer to some of the intolerances of Middle East, uh, it didn't used to be that way. When we discussed the uh, nuclear proliferation in Iran, uh, before the, during the shot, there was a need, there was a need that if India, Pakistan, and Israel have nuclear power, then the Iranian who felt superior in the region also required to have nuclear power. But it was not pursued forcefully uh, until there was an invasion of Iraq. At that point, there was a feeling going around in the Middle East that if you did have nuclear power, then it wouldn't be so easy for American troops to enter without provocation into the country just because they wanted to. And the policies of um, Middle East, Europe and the Middle East, not so much European but American policies, is fed into the extremism <coughs> to the religious. When you had cluster bombs blowing up kids in different, <coughs> in different part of Lebanon that are more made by USA. They may not be fired by USA, by US, but they're marked by USA. And you have Geneva Convention that forever, ever tried to vote to give the occupied land back to the Palestinians and he was vetoed by United States singly, single and There has to be a shift by the world. I 
out of this hypocrisy that we are there to help you and truly mean to come to terms and resolve the issue of <coughs> the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And it has to be solved because people are tired. People are tired to look every time they enter into a plane whether they're going to get blown up or every time they're going to go into a, a, a supermarket they may get killed. You ask the question. Yes, the question. Yes. The question is, thank you. The question is, I believe there is a fallacy that needs to be changed by Western world, and it, not, it will not come by that kind of conversation. I'm a diplomat, so my answer will be very cautious, of course. <laughs> um, but, but just let me say a, a few words about what you were saying. Um, uh, I think really, uh, and I'm trying by that to be as honest as possible, uh, in the Middle East, whether it be the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whether it be Lebanon, uh, whether it be uh, Syria, whether it be Iran, whether it be Iraq, um, everybody ha has a bit of the blame uh, and of the responsibility of what is going on, undoubtedly. Um, and I'm, I totally uh, agree with you, and I think this has been French position for many years, that if we want to solve all those different issues that are, by way or another, related among themselves in the Middle East, to find a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is certainly uh, the priority. Um, uh, mind you, I tend to think also that with the, uh, what has happened since the Iraqi intervention, there is something a bit new now that we ha have to take into account, of course, is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Iran and, and the fact that uh, having gotten rid of his two enemies at its frontiers, Iraq on one side, uh, the Taliban on the other side, Iran has suddenly moved into the, uh, in the, into the forefront of the, uh, of the region and has now become a, a major player uh, that, has, uh, that we have to take that into account and that is something rather new compared to uh, a few years ago. Uh, and, and this is certainly something that today we have to take into account much more than, than previously. But to say, as we are all saying, that we have to find a solution to the uh, uh, conflict at the moment between Israel and Palestinian, we all agree on that. And, and I would say, but I'm, I, I fear to say that in, in, in front of, uh, of uh, uh, Ambassador Jahajan, who knows so well about, about that issue, this is a very extraordinary issue in, 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 in the world's affair because it's an issue on which we more or less all agree on the solution. The solution is there. We know exactly what will be the solution in the end. It's just to go from point A today to the solution itself that is difficult and where we need the political will. But for now a few years, we know more or less what are the elements of a, of a solution, whether it be on the status of Jerusalem, would it be the borders, would it be the question of demilitarization, would it be the question of the refugees. Um, we know more or less where we have to go and what will be the result in the end. It's just how to go there, which is so difficult, and which makes it so difficult today still to find a solution. And this is exactly what we're seeing today with the Annapolis process. I think everybody agreed that this was a, an interesting initiative. We had Olmert and Mahmoud Abbas together ready to talk and to uh, start a, a relation that is a rather interesting one. Uh, under at the other levels, uh, Israelis and Palestinians seem to find ways of discussing with each other. And then we're seeing one against that on the ground, on the ground itself, the reality of the ground is just uh, preventing all this to move along in the proper way as we wished, because of Gaza, because of the Hamas, uh, because also of the uh, uh, colonization policy as, um, that is going on. Uh, we all know that this is still very difficult, but I think we have no other option just to remain optimistic and try to see how we can move a a ahead. Of course, uh, it's tempting to ask a question about uh, the effect that uh, your president's new wife would have on our uh, relations with America. But instead, I would ask a question about... I would have difficulty in answering that one. <laughs> an economic question. Uh, if, if it turns out that the United States is about to enter into a, a substantial and prolonged recession, do you think that that will have an effect on the relationship in the political sphere with France or other European nations? And if so, is it likely to be positive or negative? 
If, if we look at our past experience, uh, it has always been the case when there was a recession in, in your country, uh, there were immediately repercussions in, on, in, on the European economies uh, uh, because of the, uh, the trade links, because of the investment links uh, that we have between uh, – we, uh, we amount between your country and the European countries for more than a third of the total world trade at, at the moment. So uh, we are very much interrelated and interlinked. Um, uh, so I think where uh, – so if you have your economic uh, recession, uh, we, we have the risk of going along. What could be the repercussion on the political side? I, I, would, I would say there would be and there could be some difficulty if we try together to manage and, and to try to, to, to find the proper way out of that recession, and that would be some resistance on behalf of the American administration. Uh, because, in fact, what we're seeing today more and more is that a, a, maybe not the only reason, but one of the reasons that this recession is starting to go on is all the disorders that are appearing on the financial market and um, on the banking uh, now, not only the financial market but also in the banking sector. Uh, that is having some consequences on uh, the, uh, the rate of consumption in, in, your, in, your, in your country uh, and, and bringing about a lot of difficulties. And we have to work together to sit around the table, whether it be in the IMF, in the, uh, in, um, in the, among the partners of the European Union, with this kind of uh, uh, economic dialogue that we are, have uh, set up between uh, your country and the European Union. We have to look at all those issues, uh, you know, the question of the rating agencies, uh, the question of the uh, bringing uh, a better code of conduct uh, in the financial market, looking at all this. And I have kept this for the end, Sherry on top of the cake, the, the exchange rate <laughs> between the, the euro and, and the dollar. We can't go on, on with the euro rising more and more and, and the dollar staying where it is. Because that could be a good bargain for French citizens who want to visit your country and buy some blue jeans and some nice clothes. But the truth is that for many of our manufacturing industries, this is becoming a real, a real challenge and putting a lot of pressure. Because you can't go on uh, manufacturing in, in the Eurozone and then, having created that new product, try to sell it in the dollar zone. It's becoming uh, uh, absolutely impossible as we go on. This is exactly what's happening with our aircraft industry. Uh, Airbus is uh, get, getting more and more difficulties in trying to sell its um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, aircraft it's, uh, uh, and trying to keep the prices as low as possible. So what is going to happen as we go on is that many of those producers, European producers, will outsource their production line and set those new production line in, in your country or in China or in uh, other emerging countries. And of course that will mean immediately a social unrest, uh, trade unions getting out in the streets and complaining. And, and, uh, and a lot of pressure for protectionist uh, measures. So I think we have to be uh, very careful about that. And at one point or another, we will have to see uh, how we can uh, find a solution. Uh, it's very difficult um, with uh, the importance of the, uh, of the, uh, of the markets today. Uh, you just can't do what we did in 1985 by just all the foreign and finance ministers sitting together in the plaza in New York, getting an agreement and and, and getting uh, immediate, immediate results on the markets. Today it's much more complicated, but at least we need to have an exchange of view and a sort of common attitude towards what's happening today. Uh, so that's the political, I would say, what is at the heart at today of, uh, uh, and maybe one of the most important issues in transatlantic uh, relations today. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that President Sarkozy wanted to uh, emphasize or prioritize European defense and his military thinking, but in reality, is, the, is there any European perception of a, any kind of threat, military threat to Europe in the foreseeable future, or in fact are you just preparing another independent uh, international police force? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's really a good question, to be honest, uh, because <laughs> this is what sometimes we find among a European public opinion, the sense that uh, we should stay on our own and, uh, uh, you know, let the others do the difficult job and, uh, and, and, uh, and remain on the side uh, of world affairs and not try to get too much involved into that. But what France is saying, and I think with us, countries like uh, Britain, uh, Spain, Germany, uh, Italy, and a few others, even Poland, is that if we want to retain an, uh, a major role in world affairs tomorrow, if Europe really wants to be heard and have its voice heard in world affairs, in the international circles, in the main international fora, then we need to have uh, a comprehensive global European defence that is solid and serious and that can play its part. Um, we have shown in the past that we were able to do that, uh, but we have done it with a few countries. Um, it, it's interesting what's happening at the moment in this European force that we are setting up at the border between Chad and Sudan. because. France has pushed this idea, saying that we should play our part there and that would be a useful contribution to try to solve the Darfur problem because the Darfur problem is becoming more and more uh, a problem also for Chad at its border. Uh, so we have decided that we were ready to put the necessary troops, but we wanted some of our European partners to get into that. It was difficult at the beginning, but look who is getting into that. Poland, Ireland, Sweden, uh, Austria, Denmark. And mind you, even the uh, Russians are telling us uh, they could be interested in coming and helping us to that. So we're starting to set up a European force that is a rather interesting one. And we're doing that with the, uh, with the uh, total agreement of, uh, of uh, your administration, which finds that rather interesting. And we're going to see if it works. But uh, I think if Europe wants to retain some sort of foreign policy, we have to do that. Uh, I think, as we go along, but this is um, more of a personal uh, opinion, I would say, uh, for somebody who has worked a lot if, in world affairs, as we go along and as we manage to uh, have uh, a real and true, solid uh, European foreign policy, we will have to do it with more flexibility than what we have done in the past. And that means that maybe only six or seven countries will decide to work on, on such an issue, six or seven others will work on another issue. This is, I think, more and more what will be the shape of the European Union in with regard to foreign policy and maybe also defence. Yes. Would you comment on, on France's position on the uh, missile defence shield that NATO, especially the United States, are contemplating that's angered? The Russians? <laughs> Two or three remarks on that. Um, we understand why uh, the Americans think it necessary to have uh, this uh, this precise uh, uh, defense uh, missile missile defense uh, process going on, uh, for the reasons that have been mentioned by the Americans themselves, uh, notably the danger that uh, Iran could represent in the future, uh, even if we think that we may have a little bit more time because. Uh, um, Iran is, is not yet maybe ready to launch uh, um, a rocket that will reach uh, Europe in, 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 in the near future. But, but we have to prepare ourselves for that. Uh, um, but what we're saying, secondly, is that it could have been done in a better way not to antagonize uh, the Russians. And we think that it's necessary to see how we can talk with the Russians to avoid any misunderstanding there. Why, among other things? Because precisely, if we're thinking about having this uh, uh, defense missile uh, in order to counteract what could be uh, any kind of uh, strike by the, the Iranians, uh, the, the Russians are, not, are on our side with regard to the Iranian issue. They have been rather helpful and rather constructive in order to try to convince the Iranians to stop their nuclear program so far. They haven't succeeded, just like we haven't succeeded, but at least they have tried and they're very much on the same line as we are. So we think it's, it's a pity, <laughs> in other words, that on this issue we are having here some um, misunderstanding and, and some divisions. Thirdly, with regard to what could be a more general uh, system of, of, um, of uh, missile defense for Europe, there we think that we need more discussion and to think a little bit more about this for many reasons, if only for financial reasons, because we don't have the means to 
you have a, a European uh, defense of that sort today. And also because if we go along that line, that would represent a major change uh, to our uh, strategic concept and to our uh, strategic concept and, and security concepts for the time being, not only for France but also for the European uh, defense in general. So we think we need more thinking about that and, and uh, uh, we need more time to look at all this. Yes, sir? Hmm. I have a question in relation to the Turkey's accession to the EU. I was wondering if you could elaborate on France's policy on that and uh, the possible failure of Turkey's accession. Good question. <laughs> And difficult one. Um, maybe not so difficult because uh, Nicolas Sarkozy has been very uh, blunt about about. He thinks that um, uh, the the idea of uh, a Turkish uh, Turkey membership or Turkey becoming a member of the European Union is uh, is not possible. He think it um, it uh, it would be a, a mistake. He thinks that Europe is not well prepared for that, uh, and that at least we need much more thinking about. Uh, uh, about that among ourselves. This is why, among other things, we have set up a, a, a new uh, committee of wise men to think about the future of Europe because we really think it's, it's necessary. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to retain or, or increase or improve our relationship with, with Turkey. This is why Nicolas Sarkozy has agreed at the same time that the negotiations that have started with Turkey could go on but well, the small difference um, with the previous negotiations where we uh, stated very clearly that that was for a formal membership of, uh, of, of Turkey. What Nicolas Sarkozy is saying is let's go on with the negotiations. They could last some years, maybe up to 10 years because those kind of accession negotiations are very long. Let's just go on to see how far the uh, Turkey could take on board all the uh, European regulation, all the uh, European legislation, and that at the end of that process we will see and we will look at the kind of partnership we could have uh, between the European Union and Turkey. Maybe after all the Turks themselves as they go along those negotiations would find some of this legislation very difficult to accept because that goes very deep into some of the uh, um, most difficult issues related to Turkey. Uh, freedom of religion, uh, uh, the uh, education, educational system, etc., etc. So let's be very pragmatic. Let's go on. Let's go on with those negotiations. And at the end of the day, we will see what, where we are and we will decide all together what kind of uh, relationship we will set up with, with Turkey. This is our line at the moment. Yes. Would you comment on Kosovo? On Kosovo? <laughs> It's, um, it's, it's, it's somewhat difficult to comment at the moment because as things are, are turning uh, somewhat badly at the moment in Kosovo, there has been some, some violence today, as, as you have seen. We were expecting that a little bit for the last few days because definitely the Serbs of, uh, in Kosovo are trying to set a sort of de facto situation whereby you would have a partition of the north of Kosovo from the rest of that country. And we have to deal with that, in the, I would say, in, in the most diplomatic way and, uh, and very, um, go there very cautiously. We, as you see uh, this morning, the um, international force, Kofor and Minuc, have tried to get back the tribunals that were uh, at the moment occupied by the, the Serbs from Kosovo, and this has not gone very well. Nobody is happy with the present situation in Kosovo. We all had um, hoped that we would find an, an agreement with the Russians and the Serbs uh, and, and with Belgrade. We haven't managed. It, this is not certainly not due to the fact that he has tried. We have come out with many ideas in the last six months. Each one of these ideas has been rejected by, by, by Belgrade and, and Moscow without any any glimmer, uh, any opening towards something else. Um, so at the end, the problem was very, uh, was very clear for us and the dilemma was very clear. Either we were going on with the present situation and that it was the Kosovo who would just get out in the streets and start again and, and, and decide to get independent on their own through violent means, or we decided, as we did, that we would uh, go for a unilateral declaration of independence on behalf of Kosovo, that we would support it, but we would create at the same time a whole set of arrangements to protect the Serbian minority in the north of Kosovo. 
in fact, uh, a whole set that was all, all, all there in the uh, report made by the uh, former Finnish president, Atisari, uh, who are very good reforms and who are protecting the Serbians in the, in the, right, in the right way. So we have decided that way. We're not uh, happy with that because uh, it is uh, overstretching a little bit uh, the legal pro usual legal process of the, of the United Nations. But what else could we do? We, were, we had all the information that if we didn't do that, it would be the Kosovo who had gone out in the streets, and we would have found ourselves with an impossible situation. So now what we have to do is try to go along that process that we have decided and try to bring everybody back to a much more, um, I would say, peaceful process than the one that is appearing at the moment. It's not going to be easy. We have one or two good assets. The first one, as far as we can see, is that the Russians are not trying to uh, overreact. They have remained rather cautious themselves. And if the uh, actual president in, in Belgrade, President Tadic, wins the uh, general elections that are going to take place in a few days, uh, then the voice of the moderates will maybe will be heard, and that will be very useful. It's going to have to be the last question. <coughs> Yes. Could you speak a bit more about the possibilities of reform of the Security Council? You know, what is you know, the potential for success with that kind of, a, of an effort? Uh, very difficult, to be honest. We have tried several times and we never succeeded, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try again. So what we want to see uh, is to try different steps. The first one is just to see in an informal way whether the, uh, uh, the decision you know, to appoint uh, a few new permanent members, Germany, Japan, Brazil, South Africa, uh, India, and then uh, we'll have the question of one or two more because if we got South uh, Africa, uh, Egypt will immediately say uh, that uh, South Africa cannot represent Africa uh, alone. Then also if you put in Brazil, then Mexico will complain that they are being uh, forgotten. So we have to look at that. To be honest, I don't think this will go very far, once again, precisely for the same reasons why we didn't succeed last time. So we have to look at maybe other ways, transitional uh, periods, whereby we would have a, a new kind of permanent members for a transitional period uh, and see if that can work. We, we have to find, uh, to use our imagination to find ways of going ahead. But uh, I just want to stress the point I was putting for, forward a few minutes ago. If we don't do something like that, uh, we better be cautious because the Security Council we could start being criticized more and more as being a place that does not really really represent uh, the interest of, of many countries around the world. And the fact that you have those five permanent members there that are usually working together, you know, to come out with solutions and with uh, draft proposals here and there is something that is not going down uh, uh, very well anymore among the other members and even those that are not uh, on a rotating basis, members of the Security Council. And this is once again what I was saying uh, before. We are now living in a global world, as we are all saying, but the global world is not only about economy, it's more and more about diplomatic uh, affairs and about political affairs, which means that um, look at the new kind of uh, uh, meeting of minds that, uh, or gatherings even, meetings that are taking place be between the uh, uh, southern hemisphere major partners, meetings between in Indonesia, between Indonesia, South Africa uh, and Brazil. Still, those three countries talk a lot about each other. This didn't happen five years ago, six years ago, but they are getting used to work together and, and talk to each other, and this is having uh, repercussions, implication afterwards on many issues that up to now were mostly dealt with by the uh, five major countries. We have to take that into account, that reality, because this is what the world is about today, uh, and we just 
can't pretend that this does not exist. Um, and uh, you have to be aware, and I, to the point of being controversial, I would say that. Look at somebody like President Ahmadinejad of Iran. He has understood that very clearly. The man is all over the place. <laughs> he goes to Indonesia. He talks with South Africa. He's ready to go to Brazil. Uh, and uh, you have to take, to take that into consideration if you want even to uh, counteract and to be able to uh, uh, to uh, to be uh, uh, to take some initiative against against Iran, you have to take that reality into account.